him. Yeah, he'll be here. He was at dinner, um, and I think we just didn't get uh, back from dinner. I didn't know about the signing, but I am aware that he is aware of this panel and will be here. Um, in the meantime, uh, let's introduce everyone else. This is um, Research in the Science, where do you find the science for your science fiction. And uh, Daniel, why don't you start with introductions? Sure. So I'm Confusion. Daniel. I am the head of science here at uh, Confusion. Um, my scientific background is a sparsely set of college credits. Um, I'm a good researcher, maker. I make things up. Uh, Christine Smith, I wrote science fiction as Christine Smith and supernatural thrillers as Alex Gordon. I have a chemistry degree and my research mostly involved, well, we can talk about it later, but you know, talking to people and getting a hold of textbooks that I understood about 5% of and the usual mm -hmm. kind of stuff. I'm Lawrence M. Schoen. Uh, my doctor's in cognitive psychology. I'm currently, as a day job, the director of research and analytics for a small medical center in Philadelphia that does mental health and addiction treatment. And I'm the author of Bursk, now available in the dealer's room. And we have Gordon. Sorry, I'm running late. Is it all right Hi. if I record this? We missed you. Gordon, is it all right if I record this and put this on YouTube? Certainly. Okay, then. Oh. And I'm doing. I'm, I'm recording for the Science Fiction Learning History Association. That's one of our releases. Okay. I don't think she's got the pen. The pen. Caught stealing the pen. <laughs> but now, when you swipe it Catherine, back, they'll you think he has it. I will introduce myself. Uh, I'm Catherine Schaefer. I'm a science fiction writer, and I'm a science writer. So I get my science directly from the source. Um, and uh, in a minute, Gordon will introduce himself when he's done the paperwork. Scribble, scribble, jot. My name is Gordon Smith. I'm a TV writer. Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, for uh, for this panel, we have. Um, resources for finding good science, where to go, what to look for, and how to cite it. Um, so, I mean, I guess let's start, uh, if you're writing uh, anything for TV or for fiction or for a book and you need science, what, what's your go-to source? Like, where do you get your science? Do you pull it out of your head? Do you search the literature? Where are you getting it? Go online from well-curated sources, like if they end in EDU or if I know it's from a university or a research site. Uh, I've used textbooks in the past uh, for the brain science and the science fiction uh, series. I was lucky enough to have a friend whose husband was a top brain researcher in the US. Going to talk to people who actually do the research is actually a lot of fun. You go get pizza and you spend the evening at their house and you just talk <laughs> all, all about brains. So, and they love it. And they love it because they love the questions, they enjoy the extrapolation and what you're thinking about and it gets them thinking and it's, it can be a lot of fun if you can find a good source. People, well, isn't it uncomfortable talking about being brains while eating pizza? I mean, just... <laughs> it, he was totally, because of the type of work he had done, he, it went right over his head and we really didn't even think about it. I was so busy taking notes that the, uh, the nausea factor didn't kick in at all. That's really the secret sauce, though, um, is don't stop at the Google search the Wikipedia page, right? <laughs> Find out who wrote that Wikipedia page and reach out to them. Don't hope that a, a friend of a friend can introduce you, but let's send an email. Hey, I'm Daniel. I'm writing about you know machine-to-brain interfaces. You're doing some great work there. Do you have 15 minutes to so I talk about my project, right? Because you, if you're waiting for someone to publish the information that you want to talk about, you're going to be behind the curve significantly by the time you're ready to write about it. Yeah, I'd say go to your local university and, and just go to the department that has that person. And odds are, particularly if you bring them a pizza, um, researchers like to talk about their work. Scientists like to talk about science. And they like 
if they can, if they have the time to spare, they like being able to disseminate that information to an audience that isn't a bunch of half asleep sophomores sitting, you know, in the back of the room. Um, when I was in academia, I just went down the hall, plopped myself in, in some some other professor's office, and said, "So, can this work?" And then say, "No, Lawrence, that doesn't work." And I said, "Explain it to me." And and oh, oh, and here's some pizza. And, uh, so you keep it in your back pocket. Always, always. Um, pizza is the currency of research. You don't want to use you don't want to use alcohol because you know the quality of the information you get is really great. Um, but I, I was on a similar panel last year with Gregory Benford. You all, you all know Gregory Benford. Uh, he was here last year. No, not here. Different con. The art science writer? Yes. Physicist, <laughs> Professor of Physics, Gregory Bedford. Yeah. Uh, and he said the most brilliant thing I've heard on one of these panels. He said, he always puts in a piece of science at the beginning of a book, and he nails it. He makes sure everything yes. is perfect. And then they believe him, and he can make it up after that if he has to. <laughs> <laughs> you have to establish, uh, establish credibility. You establish, you establish your, your, your bona fides. And... Um, uh, this new book has lots about memory and physics. The memory is spot on because that's what I know. The physics is made of hand wavium, and it's a rare earth element, hand wavium. What about Penrose's theory on microtubules? Don't talk about Penrose. Penrose is another character in a different book who has multiple personality disorder, and we don't call it that anymore, but that's what people know it as. Anyway, um, but you have enough legitimacy leg uh, and, and reasonable ideas and, and you just talk fast enough. Gordon, how about you? What's your research method? Um, I mean, we the shows that I've, I've, I've worked on, I've worked on uh, Breaking Bad and, and uh, um, Better Call Saul, so we, it's much more finding the thing that kind of fits the piece, so it's more, it's more directed like, oh, we're we have some element with, oh yeah, I've heard this. It, it, it's actually much more freeform, like, oh, we need something that'll do this specific task, and then we have to go and find the science for it. We got very lucky, especially on Breaking Bad. Um, we had a, a chemist from, uh, I believe she was the University of Oklahoma, Dr. Donna Nelson, who reached out to us and was like, you guys have a lot of chemistry in your show. We, I would like that chemistry to be right. And so we, we talked to her a lot. Um, we talked to the DEA when we were getting into sort of what the chemistry of. Uh, so you know how to cook meth? Oh yeah, no, be a clearly. Clearly, <laughs> I know. What it, I know an No, I don't. I don't know. I know how to make it look like. Exactly. Well, that's 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 what we needed to do is know, know how to make it look right. But well, like so, yeah, actually, I'm curious about that because I feel like you probably don't want to give away the details of how to cook meth. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no, I mean, if you're so responsible, <laughs> that would never occur to me. We we uh, we we skip steps. We, yes, we, yeah. we, we we never showed the exact recipe. We did the steps that are there are usually correct steps, but there are not. They're not all together, and they're not all in the right sequence, and they're not all the right ingredients in them in that way. But because we wanted to make sure that people couldn't just be like, oh, this is how you do it. Right, but yeah. across the series, mm -hmm. we have enough individual scenes that if we put them together, we know how to make them. No, there's steps that are just completely yes. left yes. out. Yeah. <laughs> that are never, that are so never in there. Did you like Although have I think a, we did show how to make ANFO uh, explosives. Did you actually like have calls with people at the DEA at, or scientists or doctors mm -hmm. to, in, in order to set this up and decide you know, what you were going to show and how you were going to make it look real? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, so we would talk to them. We would talk to them and, uh, even more than, than, you know, we there was sort of, because it's you're shooting a TV show, so there's two steps. It was like, we would do part of the research in the writer's room to be like, does this fit the story? Is the story going to work? Is this, does this fit the elements that we need? And then our production design team would go and like figure out how it actually, like, what, what does that look like when you actually, because even when it comes to it looking right, we could, there are chemicals that we couldn't use. Like the actors can't be around those chemicals; they're toxic. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, you can't. Dangerous. Yeah, it's we had to find high. something when, when we, there's, you know, there is a scene where Walt Wall is making Anfo. Uh, what I can't remember what it does. It's an oil-based explosive that that you can make out of common household chemicals, um, and if you cook it on the stovetop, right? 
but it looks like this weird gray goop. But we obviously weren't going to have him make actual explosives on his stovetop, so they, we had to have our special effects team figure out what looks like the real thing but isn't the real thing. So there's a, there's a series of tricks that you have to kind of, kind of do for, for us or that we've had to do. Sure. So I'm curious um, for all you guys, um, everyone, you know, every writer has, uh, you know, kind of a, a limit of how far they're going to go in adhering to the exact science of, you know, real science in their books or whatever. Um, some don't care very much and some are very, like, very meticulous about it. So, like, I want to hear about your process. Like, when you do your research, how meticulous are you? How correct does it have to be? Or where do you say, okay, I don't care anymore? <laughs> so you start with your base knowledge, right? You have picked up, you know, bits and pieces of, of what has interested you and got you started writing out in the first place. And then the, the science itself will mold the story, right? Trying to make it work creates those, you know, those arcs inside the story. Okay. Uh, when I worked on the science fiction series, I went nuts with the brain chemistry. I wanted to get that exact as much as I could. But then we got into you know hybridization with using alien uh, DNA in a human being, and I mean every geneticist that I've talked to is like, no, wait, 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 wait. But I put it in there anyway because that was like the point of the exercise telling myself that you know, 150 or whatever years ago, what's considered impossible now may be totally possible. So I tried to get as much right as, as I could, but I also wanted to move the story forward. So I, I, I jumped off the deep end and you know, sad some people shaking their heads at me, but hey, it's science fiction. <laughs> Did it sell? <laughs> Although if you, but what's nice is if you can ground it in something that says, "Look, I've done this much work, and I'm taking, I'm making a change." You want to, you know, we, we we would do that even though it's a it's a much more naturalistic show, breaking bad is. But like, there are leaps <laughs> that are that are made. Uh, the one when I was talking about is like, you know, there's the scene where Walt throws down some mercury fulminate and it blows out the, the Mythbusters. <laughs> and Mythbusters. And Mythbusters. I just, watched, I just watched that episode of Mythbusters last week. Yeah. No. Exactly. But. It, the, the, the yeah, truth of it is, part. mercury fulminate is in fact is, is an explosive, and it does do that. It's just do that amount and that amount of force. No, so mm -hmm. there's some poetic license, but it sort of indicates that there's a at least some kind of true true like thread that you can hold on to. I think part of the question really revolves around how much is the science a character in the story, and if the science is is fulfilling that role then you have a greater obligation to, to get it right. Uh, otherwise, and this is particularly when I'm doing something involving language, I'm working hard to avoid things that are flat out wrong that everybody does, because there aren't a lot of people with linguistics background writing science fiction, and, and it shows when all the aliens show up speaking you know, perfect English and like this. Um, otherwise, I think, and I, I'm, I'm you know, Follow her, her example that, you know, one of the things you learn as a scientist is how little we actually know. So there's a lot of room that you can leave it blank and, and play around, but there are certain things you just don't cross over because, you know, that's going to be wrong. And if you don't have a compelling reason to suggest why, you know, we think it's wrong now, but it turns out 150 years from now it won't be. If you cannot say that based on something else in the story, then, then don't even go there. What are, what, what are you buying with that potentially losing the audience? So, I, mean, when I, was I think it's a balance. These, when I was writing these books in you know, 98, 99, CRISPR technology did not. Sure. I mean, look at what's possible now, what they're talking about doing. Did you actually have CRISPR? No. Oh, okay. No. CRISPR I, I, was invented like last month. Yeah, yeah it was. It, this is that's cutting edge. You, like, you want to tell everyone what it is? It's just this amazing gene editing technology where you can go in and snip bits out and insert other bits. There's a radio lab. It's like it's like Photoshop for DNA. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, a, it's amazing gene stuff. Chop, yeah. And then you think, well, take that and add another ten. E it moves so fast, 10, 15, 20 years, what they're really going to be able Oh my to do. gosh, now we'll be dead by then. Oh, they'll they'll <laughs> have made some sort of super virus that 
clears up your skin. I know, um, I've been watching 12 yeah, Monkeys, yeah, so there please we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Enough said. The thing that drives me crazy is when you see something in a, in a show, and it would be very easy not to get the science wrong. Like, there's a point where people will just totally throw in something that's, that's, that's BS. Yeah. And you're like, you didn't need that. You, you, you could have said, Wikipedia. You could have, you could have <laughs> said something that was accurate. You're not changing something to, to move the plot along. You're not changing something for a reason. You just we're either lazy. were lazy or you we're lazy. You, yeah, and basically it's we're just lazy. that. And it's like, this is the Star Trek technical. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like you could have, you could have gotten past that. That's where they're kind of started. The, the one time where I think they paid lip service to that was they were talking about the, the, um, the quantum filament, and someone said, so that's like a cosmic string. And says, no, no, they're nothing alike. I think Lawrence right above that. He did. Except for the Heisenberg adjusters, everything was okay. <laughs> but the audience, mm. so the audience that, that you're seeking to find, you know, with your stories, appreciates when you get it right. You know, so there is a point where you, you know, where you, the science will ruin your story. Um, and that's okay, right? So don't push you know, the, don't add quantum to something and, and call it good enough, um, which has happened time and time again, when you have a potential audience that will appreciate the effort you put in, um, consider what's that engineering geeky show um, that everyone watches but me, and it's slipping my mind. It's very popular, Big Bang Theory, right? Big Bang Theory does a wonderful job, um, despite being a sitcom, getting the science right, and people appreciate that, and it's, it's going to go on forever. There are Klingons, right, too. Yeah, across the board. Malene Biak has a PhD. Sure. Yeah. So my point is, let the you know let science ruin what you're trying to do um, for the sake of getting it right for the audience that you want to speak to. But I would say you know write science fiction that uses science you're already comfortable with, and and you'll naturally talk about things that you. You think you can talk about, and that you can, and you'll be better able to fake the things that you can't talk about because you're coming from a place of knowledge, and that's the whole Benford idea, all over again. You start out with something that's real and that you know, and you can back up, and, and then you can wander a little bit. Do uh, any of you have any favorite science that you've researched for for something you're working on? You want to tell us about, like, how did you research it, and how did it fit into the story, and um, did you research it too much? Do you, did you, <laughs> how many hours did you waste going down different rabbit holes that you didn't need? I noticed you're not answering any of your questions. <laughs> so, tell us about you, because you have something in mind here, Catherine. No, actually I don't, I'm just like, <laughs> um, no, like, um, I mean, like, actually my approach to, um, to researching science for stories, I kind of stop when I have what I need for the story, and then I'm like, and ta-da, you know, because a lot of times I'm extrapolating or making stuff up, so I go for a verisimilitude, and then if someone calls me on, I'm like, fuck you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't care, um, you know, because this is my art. Um, so I'm not actually, even though I have a science background, I'm not as meticulous. Um, and, and part of that was something I had to get over, like, what, because I was paralyzed at first when I started writing. You know, I have an, an advanced degree in biochemistry, and so when I started writing, I was like, I can't write anything because it's all wrong, or someone might discover something. So I had to get to a point where I was like, enough is enough. This is my limit, and if, if someone, you know, cares a lot about the science, you know, maybe, I, like, I try to please, like, 90% of my readers, and the other 10% are going to be like, well, you know, um, actually, <laughs> you know, just, have that gills. just has to be okay. So... It's, it's hard to balance because I worked at, for Big Pharma for 26 years, and you, you write these those certain reports where every word has to mean one thing and exactly one thing, and you counter that with fiction writing, where a word you want every word to have as broad a meaning as possible, so people can pull whatever they want. And it's hard to know when to stop with the detail. Big and Pharma does not like you to use metaphors. <laughs> no. No. Was this naming the products? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh those, those commercials. Technical English. Pardon? Simplified technical English. Technical and just making sure that no one, that when somebody reads a sentence, they just cannot draw any other conclusions right. except the conclusion you want drawn, because you're only trying to explain, you know, the, what's in the conclusion, just the <coughs> thing. 
and you will get peer reviewed out your ears. Yeah, well, yeah. If, if you're dealing with actual scientists, because in my science writing, I interview scientists, and then I write about the things they tell me, and they can be a nightmare, um, because a lot of times I'm writing at a lower technical level for the reader than what they're they're speaking in, and so they, you know, they want me to clarify something that my readers don't have the education to understand. You know, they don't have the background, they don't know all this jargon, so I have to say something that's not as precise as they want, and then I hear about it later, they're like, yeah, that's not accurate, and I you know, I'm going nice. to, <laughs> you know, and I've learned, actually, um, I, I don't even interview, like, junior scientists anymore. If they don't have tenure, I, like, I don't like to talk to them, because they're so afraid <laughs> of what their peers are going to say, or that they're not going to get tenure, they're going to get in trouble if something that I write isn't, isn't pleasing to everyone that might criticize them, so, like, I like to interview tenured professors so they don't give a shit, you know, <laughs> like they can just, you know, kind of relax about it. So to loop back around on your original question, um, how do you kind of get started um, with something that you want to write about? You have this passion, you want to write about it, um, and I'm a masochist, right? I'll start a project on how it could work first, you know, I'll, I'll, I will, you know, put together a proposal of, of what this thing is that needs to go into the story, and then you know reach out to touch points on how it's going to get built, and then you know start writing. So and it's probably the worst way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think coming from a place of passion is is, is a guarantee for, for success uh, because you, you know, you're going to hit a wall, but that you're not going to let that stop you. And then you will do the research, you'll do the legwork, you'll, you'll bribe the people you have to to pizza. get what you the need. Pizza, pizza. yeah. Pizza. Uh, and, and they take coupons, you know, so that helps too. Um, for for Barsk, um, I, I have a thing in my fiction, and somebody pointed this out to me some years back, and I realized, oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, I keep trying to come up with new ways that death is not the end of us. Uh, you know, something other than an afterlife. Uh, and, and I've taken it to a new extreme in this book, so I'm talking about there, there's a drug that lets you speak to the dead by manipulating a new subatomic particle, hand uh, a, par a subatomic particle of personality and memory. I, and I'm surprised to hear it, but yes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, sure, you just haven't seen them before. And, but then when I'm talking about how the memory works, I can go on and on, I, and I have, and I've been paid for it, uh, to lecture on memory, and, and episodic memory as opposed to semantic memory, autobiographic memory as opposed to, you know, I can give you 40 different kinds of memory, and they're all legitimate, and I can pull out sources for it. And then to reduce that to a, a level where it's part of a fictional narrative, it's a lot of fun, it's a different kind of challenge, and, and for, for grins and giggles, there, there's a bit in here where the person who invented this, dr this drug and discovered this has been dead for 800 years, and she's talking to a farmer, farmer with a PH, thank you, uh, who is working in it now, and he says, oh, so much, we've learned so much since you did this, you know, and, and sort of a little tip of the hat to the fact that science is continually changing and developing, and old theories are being turned over or modified or expanded or refuted, and on and on and on, and I don't see that piece of it often enough in the fiction, because normally you get a snapshot in time, and, and I was playing with you know, a, a, a very long span, and got to indulge a little bit there. But again, you, you, you write to your passion, and the, the parts that, that you have to, you know, wave your hands around to make work, hopefully the parts that really come through clearly as legitimate science, will carry the, the, will provide the momentum that carries the reader through the, well, that couldn't possibly work part. Sure. Interesting. So, uh, have you ever found out you were wrong? Anybody? anybody? <laughs> like, in the, the, what you wanted to write a book about? Or in a you're story? bound to be, right? There's, yeah. no, there's no future proofing what you're doing. So, yeah. I mean, I hear, I hear from friends who write near future SF that it's, That's hard. it's, it's hard. Because you're just maybe a few, you think you're 10, 15, 20 years ahead. And then someone, what, invents, and then someone invents it like <laughs> yesterday. And you're, I mean, Charlie Strauss complains about that all the time because he tries. You write X between, between the time you submit it and the time, the time it actually hits print. The world has changed. Change, yeah. 
And Walter John Williams, in, in his novel, This Is Not a Game, <coughs> predicts the Arab Spring, and the book came out just after. And it's like, oh man! <laughs> <laughs> this is set 62,000 years in the future. I th feel, feel okay. <laughs> If, if you're wrong, no one will. And all the humans are gone by then, so you know, it's all right. Well, it's already a good question here. A question? So, do you see what you're doing as helping to educate people on science, to give them knowledge, or is it pretty much just entertainment? Good question. I, I think it can be both. I, I, I write to try to cre create the, what, what I read as, as a teen or pre teen. You know, I'm, I'm going for that old sense of wonder thing. You know, I want people to go, wow, science is cool. Whether the science is right or not, I want to inspire that. Look look what you can do with science. And I think there's that, there's that line in The Martian. I'm going to science the shit out of this. <laughs> is there anybody in, the, in this room who didn't just break out and a grin at that line? Yeah. And if you are, you're in the wrong panel. <laughs> uh, the fantasy panel's down the road. Um, you know, you can educate, I mean, it, it, but oh, it, it has to serve the story, too. You know, I don't want to, as you know, Bob, hypothesis testing involves, you know, nobody wants to read that. Oh, least of all, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. So it <laughs> seems like the, the, I mean, the best education you can get out of any, any good work of you know, literature or fiction or anything like that is it's educating people about people. Like when you tell people a story and they, they're, they're connecting to the science and you see that human beings 62,000 years from now have a certain set of, of, they're still people or there's still something about that spirit or there's still something. They're you know, elephants. They're, even if they're elephants, but if they, if they tell you something about who we are now, that's that's what I like to learn they from. Don't, we don't remember any of it. Nobody, mm -hmm. So you're saying this book tells me nothing about the world that I live in. Oh, I didn't say that. Oh, okay. So that's all I'm saying. You said that. Why well, would you say that about my book? I wouldn't say that about my book. You can say it. One crack about, about cooking math. Oh, I know, right? No. Mortal just enemies. That, but just that, that, that the science is, is that, and even the science fiction is, is more about, you know, making that what if that says, what if this happened and what happens to the people there? That's, that's my interest. In this. Do you, Gordon, do you have like an example, like maybe not even science, but of like where you have felt like maybe you were showing the, the, the audience something about human nature, you know, through your research and your, you know. Um, I'm trying to think of something that fits, fits, fits the research model. I mean, we've trying to, but both the shows that I've, I've Worked on, lucky enough to work on, have been in type, like very detailed character studies about watching what happens to somebody, you know, somebody changing, so a person, and, and which is, or it, it, I think it's also asking the question: Do do people change, or are, is character revealed? So they're they're very slow character studies in that way. So hopefully, all of it kind of works in that way. Um, certainly, there, there's changed circumstances for Walt White that he definitely makes some choices, and, and those choices illuminate his path. So, I would hope all of it has some, some bearing. And, and science is a vehicle to that behavior. Yeah. yeah I, think, I mean, isn't all fiction supposed to be telling us something about the human condition? Yes. Even if the humans are aliens or elephants or automata? Christine, do you educate or entertain? <laughs> I really try to entertain. I mean, the, the science propels the situation that drives the drama and the conflict. So I, yes, I do want to get it as right as possible or hand wave it as well as possible, but it's more showing the effect on people and driving the plot forward. Sorry. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not a purpose in and of itself. I mean, I, I remember reading Analog. I mean, Analog used to be the, uh, and probably still is, the sci the more science heavy of the was, um, short fiction digests. And people writing in letters say, you know, this story was really, really good, and I learned something. And this story was really, really good, and I learned something, which wasn't the same kind of fan mail you saw from FNSF or Asimov's. And I, I thought that was good, but then I thought when I start writing, I, I don't want to write science lessons. 
That, I think, is an example of, of that flavor of science fiction where the science is a character. Mm -hmm. And then that's appropriate to, to lecture. And, and <coughs> because just as, as other characters are going to develop, the science is going to develop, and it's going to work, and sometimes not. And then that's a, quite appropriate. But otherwise, yeah, I don't know a writer who doesn't put the story first. Because if you don't put the story first, the story's going to suffer. 